Hello everyone and welcome to ESGI's webinar series. Today's topic is Mr. Greg's Favorite Things. I'm Rochelle and I'm excited to be your host for today's webinar featuring the one and only Greg Smedley Warren from the Kindergarten Smorgasbord. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Greg and let the learning begin. Thank you, Rochelle. Hey everybody, thanks for joining us tonight. We're going to get started. I want to give a huge thank you to ESGI for hosting this webinar and giving us this opportunity to learn together. And thank you to all of you for giving up some of your evening to join us. Um, this webinar tonight is meant to be fun and kind of silly. Um, it's ho hopefully you'll laugh a little bit as we go through tonight, um, get some inspiration, but also learn some classroom hacks um, to make your teaching a little bit easier. And also I'm going to be sharing a few of my favorite products that will help um, your teaching as well. So sit back, relax, and enjoy a few of my favorite things. As you may or may not know, my name is Greg Smedley Warren. I am a kindergarten teacher here in Nashville, Tennessee. I've been in the classroom for 12 years. Nine of those have been in kindergarten. I spent a year in fifth grade, two years in second grade, and then a principal moved me to kindergarten very much against my will. And I did what all grown up men do at the age of 31 when something doesn't go their way. I got in the car and I called my mommy and I cried because I did not want to do kindergarten. It was one of my no goes. Uh, but on the first day of kindergarten nine years ago, I fell in love and knew that I had found my calling and my passion. So I'm incredibly grateful to that principal for putting, pushing me out of my box and forcing me to do something that I never would have done on my own. Uh, so like I said, 12 years in the classroom. Um, and I also have a website called The Kindergarten Smorgasbord. You can find us at thekindergartensmorgasbord.com. That uh, is our website with tons of blog posts about everything that goes on in our classroom, tons of strategies, ideas, freebies, resources, and lots of fun. And just in case you want to know a fun fact about the thekindergartensmorgasbord.com, we recently learned that our website contains over 100,000 images. I live here in Nashville, Tennessee with the Mr. Um, he does have a real name. His real name is Jason, for everybody who always wants to know if he has a real name. So everybody always wants to know how I do all of what I do um, in the classroom and out of the classroom, and it's because I have an amazing support system. So Jason, or the Mr., takes care of um, the behind the scenes stuff, the social media. He's actually here on the webinar tonight answering your questions. So everybody say hi to Jason. Uh, he comes into the classroom and works with the kids. Uh, he cleans our classroom, which is huge. Um, does just anytime we need something, he colors pasta, he makes snacks for the kids. You know, if I forget something, I forget my lunch, he brings me my lunch. Um, so that's how I'm able to do all of what I do. Um, and I, he always says, people think all I do is the laminating and the cutting. And I say, well, because for teachers, when somebody does their laminating and cutting, that's huge. So that's what teachers get most excited about. But he does so much more, uh, for, not only for my classroom, but for teachers um, all over the country and around the world. And so a huge thank you to Jason for all that he does. Uh, like I said, we're here in Nashville, Tennessee, which is a great place to live. Uh, those are our doodles, our fur babies, Butters and Lulu, who I'm sure are downstairs right now um, participating in the webinar. And we recently moved into a new house, which we are loving um, and having a lot of fun settling in and getting decorated. So that's a little bit about me. Like I said, I'm a full-time classroom teacher. And these are my 21 mustaches, as I call them. Uh, you can look closely at the picture and see we're a very diverse group. We have um, six languages spoken in our classroom. So we have English, Spanish, Arabic, Somali, Burmese, and then the sixth language is a dialect of Burmese. Uh, so 95% EL students. And um, also you can tell by looking at the picture that we are very, very boy heavy. Of the 21 kids in the class, there are 16 boys um, in the class. So basically, it's a frat house. So um, I tell everybody it's a frat house because it's loud. Everybody's having a good time. We have inappropriate conversations about things. We have pants get pulled down randomly. Things go in our mouth that should not go in our mouth. And um, like I said, it's loud and we have a good time. Uh, so having all boys or mostly boys has been a huge um, shift for me. It's been a lot of fun. I'm adjusting my teaching and my classroom management to meet the needs of having so many boys. And I have to give a shout out to the girls because with five girls in the classroom, the girls really do stick together and they hold their own and they don't take anything from those boys. Um, so those are my mustaches, all 21 of them. 
Um, somebody asked the other day when I posted this class picture, um, I have a little boy who's reluctant to get his pictures taken. Um, and somebody asked, is, is he in the picture? And yes, this is all um, 21 of my mustaches. And I want you to meet my BFF. This is Oprah. Okay, so Oprah doesn't really know that we're BFFs, but someday she will, I'm hoping. You see, Oprah had this little TV show that you might or might not have seen a few years back. And she always had an episode um, in December of her TV show where she shared her favorite things. And so that's what inspired me to share my favorite things each December on our blog. And so now I'm excited to get to bring some of those favorite things to all of you who are joining us tonight. Um, unfortunately, you won't be getting a car and we're not taking you on a trip to Australia, but there are some awesome prizes to win at the end. Um, so make sure you stick around until the end of the webinar um, so you can win. So let's jump right into my favorite things. So my first favorite thing that I wanna talk about is flexible seating. So if you've seen any of our videos, if you've seen our pictures, if you follow us on social media, if you've read the blog, you know that flexible seating is something that I am passionate about. I think flexible seating is something that should be in every classroom. And I say that because flexible seating was a total game changer for my classroom. So a little bit about my journey to flexible seating. Seven years ago, I was in a small classroom, but not only was it small, it was very oddly shaped. So it kind of made this weird W shape. So a lot of unusable space, a lot of weird angles and corners. Um, so the kids would get lost in the corners. Um, some of them would get stuck and can figure, their, figure out how to get out of the corners. And sometimes if Mr. Greg needed a break, he would go hide in the corners. So the problem was with the, the kids and the tables, there just wasn't enough room for me to really run my classroom like I wanted to. And so I knew that I had to either get rid of the tables or get rid of the kids. And of course, I knew they wouldn't let me get rid of the kids and keep the tables. So I did a little bit of research and I ran across a teacher by the name of Erin Klein. She was a fifth grade teacher in Michigan at the time. And she had moved out all of her tables and desks, but she brought in furniture. Um, so I thought, well, that's cool. But if I bring in furniture, I still am not gonna have any room. So I thought, hmm, what if I just get rid of all my tables? And what if we do everything on the floor? So I came home and I, I, I told Jason what my idea was and he thought it was completely insane. And he was like, this is a disaster waiting to happen. But it's important I want to, to note that seven years ago when I started this, no, this wasn't a thing. Flexible seating wasn't a thing. It wasn't happening. People weren't talking about it. Outside of Montessori classrooms, really this wasn't something that people were doing. It wasn't being talked about. And so this was, I was really taking a big risk and really stepping out of the box and really stepping out of my comfort zone to go with no tables, no desks. So I did some research. I found some research that supported um, collaboration and creativity with you know different kinds of workspaces. Found some research that talked about how important it is for um, employees, students, to be comfortable and happy in their workspace. So I took that research and my crazy idea and I went to my principal and I said, okay, so I have this crazy idea that I wanna do in my classroom. And he said, okay, what is it? And I said, I wanna get rid of my tables and my desks and I want my kids to do everything on the floor, very much like Montessori schools. And he said, great, go for it. So I have to give a huge shout out to my principal for being so supportive and allowing me to take on this crazy idea. So on that first day of school, seven years ago, I was terrified. What if this went horribly wrong? What if it was a disaster? The thing is, you never know until you try something. So we tried it and it wasn't a disaster. It did not go horribly wrong. It was quite the opposite. It was in fact a huge success and a total game changer for my classroom. So giving students voice and choice is one of the favorite parts of my classroom. That choice and that voice allows my students to buy into what's happening in the classroom. When our students are buying into what we're doing, that builds engagement. When our kids are engaged, they're learning. When they're engaged, they're happy. And that's what we want. We want our kids to be happy and to be learning and to be enjoying school. Buy-in also means less behavior problems and more focus. After going to no tables and no desks, there was a drastic improvement in the behavior in my classroom that has remained a constant in the last seven years. In fact, we no longer use a behavior management system or a clip chart or any of those kinds of things in the classroom. 
And I give a lot of credit to that flexible seating to allowing the kids to have that voice and choice. Giving up control really has allowed me to gain a lot of control in my classroom. In our classroom, everything revolves around relationships, being engaged, and in our classroom, we have one rule, and that is be your best. And again, I give a lot of credit to giving the kids that choice of their seating, where to sit, how to sit, how to do their work, that really has given them that buy-in, which has made a drastic improvement in our classroom and our behavior. Now, I do want to address a few things, um, and I'll get on my soapbox for a minute, and I'm actually gonna get on my soapbox a couple of times tonight, so sit back and enjoy. Flexible seating is not about stuff. Flexible seating is about choice. It's about giving your kids the choice and the voice of their learning, giving them control of where to sit and how to do their work. So please do not feel pressured to spend a single penny to implement flexible seating. You don't need any stuff to do flexible seating in your classroom. You can implement flexible seating tomorrow simply by allowing your students to, to sit down in their seats, to sit on the floor, to stand up and do their work, or even lay on the floor. That is flexible seating, period. No things, no wobble stools, no rockers, nothing. Simply allow your students to sit in their seat, stand up, lay down, and do their work because you're giving them the choice and the voice. And that is what flexible seating is about. In our classroom, we have no tables and no desks. We do have a big green comfy chair, which I do not recommend that adults sit in because it has a notorious reputation for making you incredibly sleepy. And once you sit there, you will not get up as an adult. Um, so don't sit there. We have um, a high table and two high chairs um, that you can see there in the picture. We also have a very small picnic table from Ikea. Everything else is done on the floor. I also have my guided reading table, but that's it. So there, there's not a bunch of stuff. There aren't a bunch of pieces of furniture floating around. It's a chair, a high top table, a little picnic table, and that's it. Everything else in our classroom is done on the floor. So I wanna say this again, don't let that social media obsession with stuff get to you. Don't let that overwhelm you and make you think, oh my gosh, I can't do flexible seating because I can't afford it. Again, you don't need to buy anything. You don't need to spend any money. You can simply implement flexible seating tomorrow by giving your kids a choice. Allow your students the choice to sit, stand, or lay down, and that's how you implement flexible seating. Um, I'll share a little bit of research with you um, about flexible seating. You heard me mention about giving people control over their workspace. It improves their sense of well-being. Flexible seating um, really allows our kids to build those um, 21st century skills of collaboration, communication, creativity, critical thinking. And recently Google um, released their own study. Um, and what they did in this study was they, they looked at all of their employees from the time Google started until this year. And they looked at the people they hired, the people who were fired, the people who quit. And they broke it down into all of these skills. And I think they ended up a list of seven skills um, or factors of, of what made the good employees, why they were good. And you know, with their exit interviews, they came up with these seven factors. And of those seven factors, I found it very intriguing that STEM, so those STEM skills was seven. The top four skills that Google noted in their employees were the first, those four um, 21st century skills of collaboration, creativity, communication, and critical thinking. So just something to keep in mind as you're working through flexible seating, as you're presenting it to administrators. Research um, also shows a 48% increase in collaboration when using collaborative group seating or flexible seating. Um, the University of Minnesota um, also did a study where they saw um, some improvement in standardized test scores in classrooms that use flexible seating. Uh, so you can head over to the blog, the kindergartensmokersboard.com, and we have several blog posts about flexible seating, how we do it, um, how we start it, um, how we use community supplies, um, and some, some additional research. So favorite things number one, flexible seating. Favorite things number two, really saved my sanity and made me not want to leave kindergarten. Um, so my favorite things number two are glue sponges. Seriously, these are a must have. If you're not using them, my BFF Oprah says, you must make glue sponges tomorrow. So here's what happened. So I'm a brand new kindergarten teacher um, in the kindergarten classroom, having a blast. I was at a, 
extended day program, so we had an extra hour, so we had tons of extra time, so we could do a lot of really cool art projects, but I despised the glue sticks. Despised them. They really did become my arch enemy. They're like my nemesis. They were out to get me, I'm convinced. Those little orange lids would get lost, they would fall on the floor, and somebody's little feet would step on the lids and the lid would fly across the room and hit somebody in the head or worse, hit them in the eye. And that meant you had to fill out an accident report and that meant paperwork and I'm not a paperwork kind of guy. And so I'm convinced that the kids were putting the glue sticks in their noses and, and turning them all the way up and eating them because you could put out 30 glue sticks and the next day they were all gone. Nobody had a glue stick. So I was ready to throw in the towel. I was ready to walk away from all art projects, anything that required glue, we just weren't gonna do it. But I was like, mm, that probably won't work very well in kindergarten. So we even tried those special glue bottle lids, the little red lids that you have to tap to get the glue to come out. So, you know, you tap it and a little drop of glue comes out. Sounds great, phenomenal, right? Except you've got 20 or 30 kids all with a glue bottle tapping. And so now all you hear in your classroom is tap, 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 tap uh, times 30. Nope, that didn't work either. So I got rid of those. That's how we came to glue sponges. They really did save my sanity and keep me from quitting kindergarten. They're really super easy, really cheap to make, and they last all year. So we make ours in August, right before school starts, and we'll use them all the way until May. In May, we throw them out and we'll start again in August. There's no mess, um, except when someone sits on a glue sponge and the glue sponge, glue sponge sticks to their backside, true story, so all you need are sandwich containers, glue, and sponges. You simply pour a bottle of glue into the bottom of the container, place your sponges on top of the glue, and then pour on some more glue on top of the sponge, put the lid on, you let them soak for a few days, that allows the sponges to absorb the glue, and they're ready to go. Bam! Glue sponges. Super duper easy. The way they work is the students simply take their paper and they press the paper to the sponge. They do not pick up the sponge. They don't put their fingers on the sponge. They simply touch the paper to the sponge. It puts a little bit of glue on the back of their paper and they're good to go. No lost lids, nobody's eating purple glue sticks, no dried up glue sticks, no glue sticks in the ear. We can still continue on with awesome art projects and we can still do all of those fun things that require a little bit of glue. I've, put, I've shared a link here with you um, so that you can go to our YouTube channel and see the how-to video so you can see the step-by-step -step process um, on how to make glue sponges. And I said, these will last you all year. Um, but a couple of little housekeeping tips, maintenance tips for your glue sponges. Every Friday, I spray the glue sponges with a mixture of water and Listerine. And so I know the people in the chat are gonna get a million questions about how much water, how much Listerine, simple. I just get a regular spray bottle, fill it with water, then I buy a little travel size bottle of Listerine, pour the whole little travel size bottle of Listerine in the spray bottle, shake it up, and then we're good to go. The water keeps the glue sponges moist, the Listerine kills the germs. So then the only other maintenance thing you'll have to do is every month, once a month or so, depending on how often they get used, you might have to add a little bit more glue. And again, that's something I do on a Friday. If they need more glue, I'll pour a little bit of glue on the sponges and let them set over the weekend so they're ready to go on Monday. Favorite things number three is the My Letters Alive journals from our friends at Alive Studios. So augmented reality is basically 3D without the glasses. And if you're familiar with Pokemon Go, that's augmented reality. So in our classroom, we use Letters Alive and Math Alive from our friends at Alive Studios. We love combining the augmented reality of, a, of Letters Alive with our ABC Bootcamp, which is a piece of our TKS Bootcamp curriculum. This amazing technology brings learning to life by making the animals and the letters really come alive in this cool augmented reality 3D type technology. So when we're using the letter cards um, from Letters Alive, the animals come to life in 3D, so it looks like they're coming out of our, our smart board or out of your screen. The kids absolutely go nuts for this. Um, they scream and squeal, um, it's just the best time. So recently, Alive Studios came out with the My Letters Alive journals, which is a much more cost-effective way 
to bring that same augmented reality experience into the classroom. The journals are $9.95 for a single journal, um, or for a class set of 20, you can get them for $159. Um, and then students use the free app um, along with the journals to bring the pages alive. So I'm gonna show you this quick video. Um, there might be sound, there might not. You don't really need the sound to get the idea of kind of how it works. Um, but I'll show you this quick video of a couple of my students using the journals and the app. So what you see happening here is the students have used a device, in this case an iPad, they've scanned a bug. So on the journal pages, every letter page has a bug. When they scan the bug, the animal comes to life in augmented reality on the device screen. So when the girls are looking at that tablet, what they see is Gertie the giraffe standing on our class trampoline. So that's the awesome thing about these uh, My Letters Alive journals is it puts the animals into your classroom, into your living room, wherever you're using the journals at, with the tablets or your phone, there's this animal, the kids love it, they go crazy for it. As the girls move that tablet around, Gertie moves. So wherever they put the tablet, that's where Gertie's gonna go. So Gertie's on the trampoline, Gertie's on the table, Gertie's on the stage. So you can even, you can see the little green camera icon there in the, on the iPad. You can even snap photos. So you can take pictures of the kids standing next to the animals. Um, you can also switch it to letter mode. So instead of seeing Gertie, you would see the letter G. So you could even have, um, you could do letters with the um, My Letters Alive journals. Also included in the journal, at the bottom of the page, there's a sentence so that you can work on reading fluency. Um, those sentences are great scaffolding and support for um, your ELL students. Um, also on the page, there's handwriting for the uppercase and lowercase letters. Then there's also an activity um, to work on letter recognition, beginning sounds. Um, the kids can draw pictures of items that begin with the sounds. So lots of really cool things that you can do with um, the journals from Alive Studios. And these journals are a great complement to our ABC bootcamp curriculum. So what I do is I use them to take pictures of the kids with the animals that we meet during ABC bootcamp. So as we're going through our ABC bootcamp at the beginning of the year, we're using the letters alive to introduce the animals, the letters and the sounds, and then the kids can use the devices, as you see here in the pictures, to put the animals in the classroom. Another thing that um, I'm going to do with these journals at the beginning of the year, is I'm gonna switch it to letter mode. So instead of seeing the animals, we'll see the letters. And I'm gonna take a picture of my kids holding the, um, the letter of their name. So basically they're gonna be standing like this and it'll have, you know, Brandon will have a B. Um, so there'll be a fun, really cool thing to work on as we're working on learning our names and letters at the beginning of the year. You can check out these journals at journalsalive.com and stay tuned to the end of the webinar for your chance to win a class set of journals. And for more on the TKS Bootcamp curriculum, visit the kindergartensmorgasbord.com and click on Resource Center. My favorite thing, number four, um, we all know teachers love pens and markers. And so I wanted to share you, with you my favorite markers. So in our classroom, we do tons of anchor charts, tons of thinking maps, and these Crayola Super Tips have become my new favorite marker to use when making circle maps and anchor charts. I prefer this 100 pack of super tips because it gives you every possible color you could need to make your um, class charts. I really love the variety of colors and I love that you can do very thin lines and very thick bold lines. These get tons of use um, during all of the pieces of our TKS bootcamp curriculum because each of our boot camps is built on circle maps. So the circle maps are really kind of the, the meat of the boot camp curriculum. And so the kids come up with words for um, our circle maps or numbers or shapes, if we're doing addition or um, shapes or number boot camp. And then I draw the pictures. So they might come up with dog for the letter D circle map. And so then I pull out my super tips 
and with my very, very excellent artis artistic skills, I draw a dog. And so I love having all of the colors to choose from. It really has just made our anchor charts um, more colorful and more vibrant and a little bit more fun. And really, who doesn't need more markers in their classroom? All right, I hope you enjoyed that little video. So my favorite things, number five, is the toilet spider. That's right, folks, it's a spider in the toilet. So I'm a guy, and so I can say this, that boys are gross. I get it. Sometimes we just have difficulty aiming, especially when you're five, you're new to kindergarten, it's, it's just not easy. And we all know how nasty that those bathrooms can be. Um, if you are fortunate enough to have a bathroom in a, your classroom, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you're unfortunate enough to have to go into the big bathrooms where all the kids get to go, you know what I'm talking about. So I had tried everything to get my boys to stop peeing all over the floor and all over our bathroom. Everything, like desperate. Like we talked about it, we talked about it, we, we went over it. I lost my mind about it, but still you'd go in the bathroom and it's just gross. I even tried the whole shock value. Okay, you, you get it on the floor, you go in there, it gets on your shoes, you walk on the carpet, it gets on the carpet, you put your hands on the carpet, your hands go in your mouth. You get the picture. They were totally grossed out by that, but it still didn't stop it. They still were just making a mess everywhere. And so that's where the toilet spider came from. So here's what it looks like. It's simple. It's amazing how effective this is. So what you do is you simply use a Sharpie. You draw a spider in the toilet. Yep, you're gonna have to touch the toilet. That's why you go in right before school starts when the bathroom is the cleanest that it will be all year. You draw your spider just above the water line. So it gives the boys something to aim for. So I suggest that where you wear two pairs of rubber gloves, one pair to keep your hands clean. The second pair is a just in case. So two layers, double up. Trust me, people, double up before you go drawing a toilet spider. So again, you just, it's a, a Sharpie, and then you're gonna wanna throw the Sharpie away. So draw your toilet spider right above the water line. On the first day of school, I take the boys into the bathroom and I say, look, there's this spider that lives in our toilet. And it is your job, every time you come in this bathroom, to get rid of him by peeing on him. They think it's hilarious. Now they've got this challenge with the spider. We're golden. Then I bring the girls in the bathroom on the first day of school and I say, look girls, sometimes boys are kind of yucky and they make messes. And so Mr. Greg drew the spider on the toilet to help the boys not make a mess of our bathroom. It's not a real spider. I drew it with a marker. It's not gonna bother you. It's not gonna hurt you. I don't want you to worry about it because I don't want any of the girls to go in the bathroom and freak out that there's a spider in the toilet. The beauty of the toilet spider is that it makes our bathroom so much cleaner. 95% of the time, our bathroom stays clean. True story. 100% of the time before the toilet spider, it was disgusting and wet. Now with the toilet spider, 95% of the time, our bathroom stays clean. Now, I will tell you this little story. The toilet spider is not foolproof. You see, I had, a, had an incident a couple of years ago with a little guy who kept peeing on the wall in the bathroom. And for the life of me, I could not figure it out. So finally, I talked to mom and I was, you know, explaining to her the toilet spider and all the things we do to, to make the boys not, you know, make a mess in the bathroom. And she said, oh, she said, well, he is terrified of spiders. 
So he was so scared of spiders that he wouldn't go near the toilet to use it. So no big deal. Got rid of the toilet spider. I drew a target or a bullseye on the toilet. Problem solved. He went right back to using the toilet. So there you go. So if you have somebody who's terrified of spiders, draw a bullseye. The toilet spider will last pretty much all year. Um, it will slowly fade as the year goes on. Um, and then you might have a custodian who comes along and scrubs off the toilet spider, so you have to redraw it. And in that case, just talk to the custodian and say, hey, trying to make your job easier. Please don't wash away my toilet spider. My favorite thing, number six, is the doorbell. And if you've seen any of our videos, our Facebook Live videos from the classroom, you probably have heard the doorbell. And we get tons of questions about the doorbell. People always want to know, what's that sound? What's that sound? What's that magic sound that got the kids to be quiet? It's the doorbell. So you see, y'all, one of my biggest pet peeves when I go to a workshop or an in-service is when the presenter claps at us to get attention. Like, seriously, drives me bonkers. So don't. Just don't. And I, I get it. I know clapping is a very popular way um, as, a, as an attention getter, as a quiet signal. Um, I know it's a, a very popular thing to use in the classrooms. But here's the problem. If I start clapping, the kids will clap because that's how it works. I clap, you clap, everybody gets quiet. But generally what happens is I clap and you clap and then everybody's excited and starts clapping and nobody's quiet and now we're, we're loud and we're clapping. And so the whole idea of clapping to get your attention didn't really work. And if you have somebody in your class, like I did a couple of years ago, who likes to say cuss words, when he gets excited and starts clapping, then he might drop a cuss word. So then you've got a whole nother noisy situation on your hands. So that's where the wireless doorbell comes in. So no more clapping, no more call and response. The doorbell is our attention getter. Now, look, I'm a big believer that classroom, kindergarten, and really all classrooms should be noisy places. That's because our kids are having conversations, they're working and they're learning and they're having fun. It actually makes me nervous if my kids get too quiet. Like I feel like they're plotting against me and there's about to be a mutiny. So when I, so with all of that conversation and the kids working and, and having these great conversations and chatting with each other, I'm still going to need a way to get their attention and to get them to freeze and look at me. So that's where the doorbell comes in. So if I need my kids to freeze, be quiet for a second, look at me, I simply ring the doorbell. It's a very calm doorbell signal. It doesn't create any more excess noise. It rings and stops. It's very effective at getting everyone's attention. Everybody knows because it's a procedure that we've learned to freeze and look at Mr. Greg. It's very cheap. You can get these at Amazon for about $10. Um, you can get them at Walmart, Lowe's. The one that I use um, that you see here in this picture um, and you see in a lot of the pictures um, from my classroom and the, the one that you hear in all of the videos is from Sato Tech. It's available on Amazon. It comes in all kinds of fun colors. Um, I think it runs about $15, maybe $20. You can even buy these doorbells now with um, two receivers, two speakers. Um, so you, you plug it in. Um, they plug into a regular outlet, and then you've got the button. Um, so you plug it into the outlet. What I do is I hot glue the button onto a clothespin, so I always have it either clipped on my shirt or my lanyard. And then anytime I need to ring the bell, it's right there. I can just ring the bell. So um, this year, um, I bought one with two speakers. So there's a speaker in the front of the room and a speaker in the back of the room because the frat house was a little wild. And so I needed two speakers to make it a little bit louder. You can get one speaker. The thing about it is these doorbells are fairly loud anyway. So um, you can adjust the volume. You can change the tone. Um, so you can do lots of fun things with them. Um, a quick little story about the doorbell before I show you a little video of the kids using the doorbell. Last year, we were started our day, it was morning meeting, we were in our circle. I rang the doorbell for the first time and it made this completely random sound that we had never heard because I just kept it on the normal doorbell sound. So I rang the doorbell and you know, you'd hear ding dong, ding dong, and that was it. I rang the doorbell this morning and it made this really weird, bizarre sound. And we all kind of, the kids got quiet. I mean, they responded immediately to it, but we all kind of looked at each other like, hmm, that was odd. You know, it's technology. It's probably just a fluke. So a little bit later, rang the doorbell again. It made the same noise. And I was like, okay, something's up. And about that time, 
one of my little boys was just, he couldn't hold it in. He just cracked up. And I was like, ah, I was like, I said, so Xavier, did you happen to visit the classroom yesterday after Mr. Greg left and play with the doorbell? And so Xavier, whose mom works in the building, wandered into the classroom after school and changed the doorbell signal. And then it got to be a fun game for Xavier. And so we never really knew what noise the doorbell was going to make because Xavier thought it was funny to change the doorbell. Um, so I'm going to show you this video again. I'm not sure that the sound will work. Hopefully it does. If not, you're going to notice the kids working and then you'll notice them freeze. When they freeze, that's when they hear the doorbell. So the class has been taught the procedure. The doorbell rings, your hands go in your lap, you freeze and you look at Mr. Greg with your bubble in. Works perfectly. Again, you can get them on Amazon. The one I use is from Sadotech. Um, there's a, a, if you go to the, our website, thekindergartensmorgasbord.com, type in doorbell, you'll find a blog post with a link to the doorbell that I use. Favorite things, number seven, are the Kindergarten Smorgasbord Research Projects. And you heard Rochelle mention this um, at the beginning of the webinar. So our TKS research projects really are kind of a staple of our curriculum. I created the research projects um, several years ago when we got the new standards that wanted kindergartners doing research and writing. And so I was very overwhelmed by those standards because how in the world are you gonna put kindergartners on Google and say, type in Google dinosaurs and research about them? So that's where the research projects came about. They truly came about from, from a need that I had in my classroom as a way to meet these standards. Um, so the, the research and writing standards are met. These are also aligned to the, um, the NGSS standards, the Next Generation Science Standards, which I do have um, tests available on ESGI for those standards. They also do meet social studies standards as well. These research projects make research and writing not only kid-friendly, but developmentally appropriate. The research is done with read-alouds and videos, and then all of our learning is recorded on various class charts. And then the students record their learning in their research journals. So we'll do a read-aloud, we'll watch a video, we'll put all of our learning on a class chart, and then the kids take that learning and they put it into their research journals. The kids love these research journals. I had one up a couple of months ago. It was a Friday afternoon. Um, I pulled one up on the screen to print for our next research project. And the kids are like, oh, oh, there's our research journal. They were so excited. And again, that's what we want. We want our kids to be so excited about, about learning. They love these research journals because it's theirs. It belongs to them. It gives them ownership. And they really do feel like experts as they, re they record all of this learning in their journals. Um, so every research project starts with a schema map where we record our schema, which is what we already know, very similar to a KWL. And then we create our class charts, and there are a few examples of them here on the slide as we progress through the research project. Each of our research projects is designed to be completely flexible, so it's adaptable to any curriculum, any scope and sequence, any kind of time frame. In our class, um, they last for two weeks, and they do integrate all of our science and social studies standards which is great because that frees up some time during our day to do some art projects. We actually start our research projects at the very beginning of the year with our school supply research project. What this project does is it teaches us how to use our school supplies, but it's also teaching us how the research projects work. work. So it's teaching the kids the processes and the procedures and the expectations of the research projects because the process for these stays the same throughout the year. And so by giving the students that, that same process, it really gives them the scaffolding and the support that they need to help them focus um, more on the learning and less on the process and gives them that confidence to really focus on the learning. So you heard Rochelle mention, um, we have a special offer for you and I wanna go ahead and talk about that briefly. So all of our research projects are available on Teachers Pay Teachers and on the Kindergarten Smorgasbord online store at tksstore.com. Um, you can buy all of them individually. We also have two research project bundles. There's a fall bundle and a spring bundle. And we tried to kind of separate all the, pro the research projects, um, thinking about when you, most of, of us would be teaching those, those themes or those skills or those projects. 
Um, each of the bundles is available anytime for 50% off of the regular price. But for being here as a part of the webinar tonight, you can get the spring bundle at an even bigger discount. You're gonna be able to get the spring research project bundle for 66% off. So the regular price of our research project bundle, the spring bundle is $202. Now through midnight on March 30th, you can get the spring research project bundle for $75.75. Again, that's a 66% savings on that research project bundle. It includes 17 research projects that really will cover um, the entire spring semester in your classroom. That special price is available on Teachers Pay Teachers and on the TKS online store. And again, that's only good until March 30th, and it's only on the spring bundle. So make sure to check that out and grab your bundle. We're getting close to the end of my favorite things. Another one of my favorite things is, of course, ESGI. This is a must-have for every classroom. If, you've, if you use it, you, I know you love it. If you haven't used it, hopefully this will inspire you to sign up for your 60-day free trial. What I love about ESGI is that it's a one-on-one -on -one assessment tool that makes assessment easy and fast, and it really helps with data collection and data analysis. I really love that I can assess on the fly. So I can grab my iPad, I can plop down, I can assess the kids on addition to five and I can see how we're doing. I can see who's getting it, who's not getting it. I can get a good understanding of what they're struggling with and then I can adjust my instruction just like that. Um, which I think is one of the biggest benefits of ESGI is that ability to really focus and target your instruction as you're going through a unit or as you're teaching a skill really gives you that, that up to the minute data so you can really help your kids and meet your kids where they are. I love that I can pull up an, an item analysis report and see exactly what my kids missed. So again, it gives me that ability to really target and differentiate um, instruction. We all know differentiation is challenging with the item analysis from ESGI really makes differentiation easier. One of the biggest ways that I use the item analysis report is with sight words. So I'll test my kids on the sight words I'll pull up that item analysis report. I'll see the most missed sight words. And so I'll take the most missed sight words and I'll create a couple of new sight word centers for the kids um, to, to practice those words. So they're practicing the words that they need the most. And I've been able to target and differentiate the instruction and give the kids practice right where they need it. Um, a couple of other things that I love about ESGI are the parent letters and the flashcards. So I can test the kids on the sight words, then I can print parent letters, and it says, today I tested Greg on his sight words, he got these sight words right, he missed these sight words. Then I can print a personalized set of flashcards to send home for the parents to practice. Parent, parent conferences, I can pull up ESGI, we can look at their data. Um, data meetings, we can pull up ESGI, look at the data to see how the kids are doing. Um, again, you can sign up for a free 60-day trial using the code SMORGI. It's right there on your screen. Um, and after your 60-day free trial, if you want to um, subscribe to ESGI, uh, the code will save you $40 um, off of your first year. Um, so again, that code is SMORGI to get your 60-day free trial, and it'll save you $40 off the cost of your first year of ESGI. And don't worry, I got you covered. We're gonna give away five one-year licenses to ESGI at the end of the webinar. So stay tuned for that. And finally, I told you I was going to get on my soapbox a couple of times tonight. My favorite thing, number nine, is hashtag happy classrooms. We all know that when we look at social media, when you turn on the news, there's so much negativity surrounding teachers and schools and classrooms. So I'm, I'm here to tell you this. Teachers are not failing our kids. Our schools are not failing our kids. Politicians, people in charge, they are failing our kids. Every day we show up, our kids show up, and amazing things happen in our classrooms. All across the country, in every school, amazing things are happening. The problem is, is that nobody knows that. Nobody sees what goes on in our classrooms. Nobody's telling our story. We don't have a marketing department. We don't have a PR person who's out there speaking for us and telling our story. We are the marketing department for our students, for our school, 
for our classrooms and for our profession. And so a couple of years ago, my friend Kayla Delzer from Top Dog Teaching and I, we were talking about this and we wanted to do something. We wanted to give teachers the power to take back that conversation. We wanted to give teachers a voice and we wanted to take over the conversation to drown out the negativity and let the world, and by the world, I mean our communities, families, our cities, let people know what truly happens in our classrooms. And so that's where hashtag happy classrooms was born. So the, the, the goal of hashtag happy classrooms is just to, to share your stories. And so what we encourage everyone to do really twofold. Number one, every day on social media, because look, we all know you're on social media, sharing recipes, watching cat videos. So while you're on there watching your cat videos, share a positive from your classroom. So every day you go on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, you share one happy positive thing that happened in your classroom or your school, use the hashtag happy classrooms and let people know this is what really happens in the classroom. And if we all start doing that, if we all start using hashtag happy classrooms, we take control of the conversation. We change the narrative that surrounds teachers and schools and classrooms. We let people know that that stuff that you hear, all of that negative junk, that's not true and that's not real life. This is what really happens in the classroom. It's time that teachers stand up. We start using our voices to speak for our kids and our schools and our profession. And so I encourage you to start posting every day using hashtag happy classrooms to tell your story, to tell the story of your classroom and to tell the story of your students. The second thing I want you to do is share this with every teacher that you know, share it with your friends, your colleagues, get the word out so that more people can start using hashtag happy classrooms. Imagine this. So I looked right before we started the webinar, we're getting close to 60,000 happy classrooms posts on Instagram. Imagine if that were tripled. Imagine if we had hundreds of thousands of posts. Imagine if we, if we trended on Twitter and on Facebook. Imagine the impact that we could have if hundreds of thousands of posts were being seen about the true story of what's happening in our classrooms. That's how we affect change. That's how we tell our story. That's how we advocate for our students and our profession. So I encourage you, if you got nothing else from this webinar tonight, take away hashtag happy classrooms, start sharing your story and the story of your students and your classrooms and let the world know how amazing our classrooms and our schools our teachers and our students are. And on that note, I want to say something else because I, and I know I'm going to get some feedback from this and that's okay, I'm ready for it. Let's stop being so negative. There's enough negativity about teaching, so let's not make it worse. So let's go to our friends and our colleagues and our husbands and wives and spouses and go to dinner and let's vent and get it out there, but let's not do it on social media. Let's not give people more of a reason to not respect teachers, more of a reason to, to look down on us as the problem. So what I hope I'm encouraging you to do is to, to be more positive and to share some of the awesome things that I know are happening in your classrooms, to share the awesome things that I know your students are doing. And so I'm really encouraging you to, to share the stories of, of your classroom and let the world know how awesome you and your students are. And I always end it with this, take care of each other. This isn't a competition. It's not a reality show. This is not about social media. This is about teachers and kids. And at the end of the day, we're all in this for one reason and one reason only, and that's for our kids. It's not about who has the cutest door. It's not about who gets the most hearts on Instagram. It's about changing the lives of our kids. And so please take care of each other, lift each other up, encourage one another, help each other out, give somebody a hug and a smile, Teaching is the hardest job in the world. And the last thing we need is to make it harder for ourselves and our colleagues. We all know that rising waters lifts all boats. So let's support each other, let's encourage each other, and let's love one another because we are in this together and we are in it for one reason and one reason only, and that's our kids. So I wanna say thank you again to ESGI for hosting us. And thank you for, to all of you for um, hanging out with us tonight and hanging out with my friends at ESGI. I hope you enjoyed tonight. I hope you've got a couple of hacks that you can use in your classroom. Hope you got some laughs and a little bit of inspiration. Um, please follow us on social media. Um, all of our social media channels are right here on the screen. We do tons of giveaways on Facebook, 
um, we share lots of ideas and resources and strategies. Um, lots of prizes being given away on our social media. So make sure to follow us so you don't miss any of the fun. And I always tell people, I encourage everybody to like our Facebook page, the Kindergarten Smorgasbord on Facebook, because we do a lot of live Facebook broadcast from the classroom. So you can actually join us live in our classroom and see what really goes on, the good, the bad, and the ugly, um, completely unedited. It's always a lot, excuse me, it's always live. You never know what's gonna happen. Um, so make sure you're following us on social media. We love to, to, to chat and, and communicate and have great conversations. So we look forward to um, seeing you all on social media. And again, check out our website at thekindergartensmorgasbord.com for um, literally thousands of posts, um, lots of ideas, lots of fun, and lots of great strategies and resources. So again, thank you for joining us and thank you to ESGI for hosting this webinar. Great, thank you so much, Greg. You should see the comments coming in. Everybody is really in love with all these ideas you presented today. So thank you so much for doing that. And I really hope that Oprah reaches out to you because you need to be BFFs. <laughs>